Welcome to MPNUniversity.tv Clinical Insights. This discussion is about loss of response while being treated with a JAK inhibitor and is moderated by Dr. Serge Verstovsek and co-moderated by Dr. Ramon Thieu. Our panel discussants are Dr. Ruben Mesa, Dr. Ola Toyoshi Odenike, and Dr. Joseph Burkal. In 2011, first of the JAK2 inhibitors was approved as a therapy for intermediate and high-risk malofibrosis. By now, we know what the benefit of the JAK2 inhibitors in malofibrosis is. Primarily, this is the reduction in the big organs in spleen and the liver, and significant improvements in the quality of life. The bone aches and pains, the itching, night sweating may improve, people may gain weight and walk more. But the issue today is uh, to define or discuss the topic of what is a loss of response to the JAK inhibitor therapy. Is it a process? Is it a one time point? How do we define loss of response? That is uh, very important for everyday practice. Ruben, in your own practice, how do you address this issue? Well, I think you summarized it well, Serge, that I judge it off of the, the two main areas where I judge efficacy, which is really how the patient is feeling as well as the issue of the spleen. I think there are many benefits that, that we see and that we hope. We hope for issues in terms of improvement in survival. We know that the issue regarding cytopenias and uh, anemia are, are somewhat separate. So I really focus on those two key issues. And I'd say that there's different phenotypes. One, there is a very small percentage of patients who are refractory upfront. They have very aggressive disease, maybe don't respond. That's a fairly small percentage. I find over time, perhaps two, three years, perhaps as a median, I think very consistent with what we saw in the comfort studies, patients can start to lose some of that response. And it can be, I tend to see more loss of response in terms of enlargement of the spleen versus loss of the symptomatic component. I view that my litmus test for evidence of really losing response and progression is when the cachexia starts to return. Mm. So if people start to lose weight, the night sweats worsen, those aspects I find the most concerning. I find some modest re-enlargement of the spleen, particularly if it's not overly symptomatic, to be something that I can tolerate, uh, particularly given the overall benefits of patients. So I view that it really is in many ways uh, somewhat of a sliding scale, uh, and uh, over time we'll learn uh, are there branch points in terms of intervention which might be uh, appropriate based on what we learn. So from what I hear from you, Dr. Mesa, it appears that it's not necessarily just the volume of the spleen or the size of the spleen, it's really the symptoms that uh, drive you to define on whether there's actually progression of the disease, is that right? I think that's one of the most critical aspects. I mean, the, the symptoms, it's not with this disease really just about treating the symptoms. Mm -hmm. The symptoms are really a marker of the impact we're having against the disease. And they really track up or down based on really the impact that we're having. I view of the symptoms, perhaps the one that is the most concerning regarding uh, morbidity, mortality in the disease is really the cachexia of the disease. As I judge patients that have a good response, almost all of them really have weight gain and really seem much more robust and regain some of that lost muscle. If they lose that, again, that's what is the biggest sign for me of, uh, of a need for, for a change, an addition, a dose adjustment, some sort of therapeutic change. So this is really talking about the loss of a acquired benefit in real terms. This is Correct. spleen and the symptoms. Mm -hmm. But in many patients we may see, whether we call this progression or acquisition, of other factors that uh, may alert us that something is going in the wrong direction. Perhaps the percent of blast may increase, or if you do the bone marrow, there might be worsening of fibrosis, or patients acquire other prognostic factors that are part of IPSS. Anemia may worsen after two or three years. These are signs perhaps of progression, of a change. Is that a loss of response? How do we address that particular issue where there is a additional factor now, not really related to the spleen or the symptoms. Dr. Burkow. Yeah, well, you know, I think that it's very difficult to be dogmatic and come with one criteria and one definition what is loss of response. I think that we know that the molecular basis of these diseases is very heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. And uh, consequently, 
as I think uh, Ruben Messa has described, uh, those are common sites we see in many of the patients who lose uh, responses, but not all. Some patients just uh, continue to feel reasonably well, but the white count starts to go high and become more anemic or uh, uh, blood counts change, and that usually precedes uh, the quality of life. Mm -hmm. Some other patients just have a marked uh, progression of the symptoms, and, and to me that's probably the most important because unless you transplant these patients, it's an incurable disease and the quality of life probably matters most. And so uh, there are, as we, uh, we are all aware, is that uh, there are patients who do extremely well, the spleen and, uh, and hepatomegaly may be controlled, but the plated counts st stop going down and you feel uncomfortable when the plated count mm -hmm. drops to 20,000 or so, mm -hmm. or lower. And uh, some of these patients now respond to old-fashioned treatment, that is the spleen mm -hmm. removal. And uh, there are many patients, and I think that what happened to splenomegaly before the JAK2 inhibitor is different now when we have uh, the JAK2 inhibitors. And certainly I've seen several patients who did extremely well when the JAK2 inhibitor was stopped, the quality of life markedly deteriorated, and they wanted to be back, and I couldn't justifiably do it uh, because of severe thrombocytopenia. But after splenectomy, several of these patients uh, regain uh, the uh, hemoglobin and mainly platelets improvement, and now they tolerate full dose of JAK2 inhibitor at least for several months. So it seems that uh, we have two options here. Uh, we are talking about the loss of response to uh, benefits that were acquired, and that takes time. Mm -hmm. And we have acquisition of other problems. Low platelets may happen. The spleen may start to regrow. Mm -hmm. uh, some other problems may uh, happen. We have option of adjusting the dose, or we have option of adding another agent, or introducing a procedure, like you said, splenectomy, to make patients perhaps eligible again for a therapeutic mm -hmm. approach with the JAK inhibitors. Is this something that we should be exploring more in everyday practice, Toyoshi? Um, I think it's important uh, in everyday practice to separate the issue of um, toxicities that I expected with the use of JAK inhibitors from the issue of the loss of response. Sometimes they can occur together, but early on um, making sure that one is um, implementing dose adjustments to manage anemia and thrombocytopenia may allow a patient to stay on long enough to be able to enjoy the benefits that we have all um, acknowledged, um, the improvement in splint size and um, constitutional symptoms. Over time though, um, as Ruben you know, pointed out, some patients may lose that and um, I think that is uh, a significant challenge. Um, in my everyday practice, those patients in general, I consider to be prime candidates for clinical trials whenever there are trials, you know, that makes sense. Um, in the absence of um, uh, a clinical trial, that's when, you know, other, I would say ad hoc, uh, approaches in terms of you know what else you know can we try and depending on what the patient's primary problem is that's sort of what guides my choice of um, regimen so if the issue is um, uh, worsening splenomegaly and worsening constitutional symptoms and they and for whatever reason there isn't a clinical trial for which um, they are eligible um, I might consider hydroxyurea. It's an agent that still works. Splenectomy shouldn't be overlooked when the primary problem is symptomatic splenomegaly, but it's important to emphasize that that should be done in the hands of you know, someone who's experienced because of the significant uh, morbidity and mortality that can accrue to uh, patients undergoing splenectomy um, if it's done by somebody who doesn't do this you know, every day. Perhaps I, I might add one thing. I think, you know, as I try to describe it for patients, I think there's kind of three different pathways that the disease can change. One is along, let's say, the phenotype of myelofibrosis pathway, the spleen and the issue of symptoms. And I think, 
in that arena is where we know the JEK inhibitors are by far the most active. Mm -hmm. The second is the progression to acute myeloid leukemia. Now that, I think, has a bit of a distinct phenotype. That typically doesn't have a big relationship to the spleen or the symptoms and is much more around the issue of the counts uh, and the blasts and maybe relatively asymptomatic. I've seen patients who, again, progress into AML who really don't have a change in spleen or symptoms. And then finally, there's a third group, although I don't find this group very commonly. But again, with them being at some sort of new plateau with their JAK inhibitor, wherever their counts are, maybe they have mild thrombocytopenia, maybe they have mild anemia, but then they have some clear shift in terms of the counts. So they're not transfusion dependent, and now they need transfusions. Not in this first three to four months of where counts mm -hmm. stabilize, but after a year or two of therapy. And again, that can be its own sort of phenotypic change. So different pathways, and I think the different pathways have different uh, potential therapeutic maneuvers we might consider. If they move more toward the AML pathway, I really might be more considering clinical trials for poor risk AML as opposed to, uh, let's say, an alternative, uh, more mild fibrosis based mm -hmm. sort of pathway. I agree, Good 100%. Uh, transformation of acute myeloid leukemia is very detrimental mm -hmm. for the patients, yeah. and one would not really uh, think uh, much about introducing aggressive therapies like we do for acute myeloid leukemia. For the other patients that are on JAK2 inhibitors and are not transform transforming, when is actually the time to stop? Uh, when is the time to say, okay, you lost all the response? This takes in account what mm -hmm. Dr. Perkal was saying. I had patients that spleen regrew, mm -hmm. but right. they still have 10 pounds more, they still walk around. Yeah. I take the spleen out and keep them on the JAK2 inhibitor. We had patients that develop anemia after two or three years. I believe you had some experience with adding mm -hmm. androgens, perhaps, mm -hmm. or erythropoietin. Combinations, although net, not really studied in a clinical studies as of yet, studies are underway. Those that do not have overlapping toxicity perhaps are to be used, or adding hydria for patients that spleen is growing back or white cell count is going up. These are perhaps the maneuvers that we can perhaps not advocate, but think about in cases where there is still some benefit mm -hmm. to JAK2 inhibitors, not to stop it too soon. And I do think you hit mm -hmm. the nail on the head. I mm -hmm. think the number of patients that have a complete loss of benefit, I mm -hmm. think is fairly rare, you know, and I think what you sense is you know, many things that we use outside of the setting of clinical trials to try to continue to manage the patient. You know, when we have clinical trials, loss of, partial loss of benefit might be a move toward a clinical trial. But I see very few patients where there's absolutely zero benefit mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. left, so it opens up the door to, to, to other uh, approaches. Yeah. There is yet another scenario that uh, patients markedly improve on JAK2 inhibitor and then start to lose response yeah. yes. by whatever criteria. Yes. Right. And, but prior to that, they were just too sick to be considered yes. for transplant. Yeah. And when they start to Very lose yeah. response, yeah. then uh, some of my patients were successfully transplanted and they clearly were not transplant candidates before introduction of JAK2 therapy. So mm -hmm. you may actually view the loss of response as an opening for potential cure, although mm -hmm. uh, the bone marrow transplantation has its own problems, which we are all fully aware. Okay. I'm also curious, uh, Teyoshi, with what you mentioned about, you know, sometimes you may have to start hydroxyurea therapy, as you said, in those cases. So if that was the case, you have a patient who's still benefiting from ruxolitinib therapy, and with progressively increasing white blood cell count, not necessarily increasing blast percentage, how do you approach it with the addition of hydroxyurea? Do you start with a low dose? Uh, what dose do you typically start on? Um, I mean, I would certainly, you know, uh, recommend starting at a low dose because of the potential for, you know, myel undue myelosuppression since hydroxyurea is pan-myelosuppressive mm -hmm. and we know that JAK inhibitors are associated at least uh, early on with worsening of anemia. So, you know, reintroducing or introducing hydroxyurea to someone who is still taking a JAK inhibitor, one has to make sure that, you know, the anemia doesn't get worse or, or horribly worse. Mm -hmm. And so I would definitely take it at a low dose and uh, titrate up or down as the need mm 
uh, dictates, yeah. But one, one interesting concept that we may not have touched about, I mean touched on, is um, the issue of um, when someone's losing response or lost their response to a JAK inhibitor and has come off the JAK inhibitor, the idea of reintroducing the JAK inhibitor and seeing if they, you know, regain, yeah, some benefits. Certainly I've had some experience in that regard where, you know, patients have been referred who were already off ruxolitinib, for example, and then with ruxolitinib reintroduction, they regained some of the benefit that they had originally lost. And I don't know if any of the others here have had similar experiences. No, I, I would say so. I, I think that, that does fit with the, you know, the theoretical uh, issue of, uh, that was raised by Ross Levine's lab where an interruption might uh, potentially be beneficial. I saw that as well, particularly in the beginning when there was, I think, less appreciation for the initial drop in the hemoglobin and platelet that can occur. And there were a lot of patients that had kind of a brief try of ruxolitinib and perhaps mistakenly they were taken off because there was a, a drop in the hemoglobin. One could put them back and they, they, they once again were able to capture that, that benefit pretty significantly. Also very concerned uh, when we stop uh, an eject to inhibitor for often not only a lapse of the symptoms, which may be quite disabling, but also extramural hematopoiesis. Mm. And so it's not unusual that the liver becomes quite big, mm -hmm. even with some liver function abnormalities. And, and the patients beg you to uh, start the JAK2 inhibitor regardless of platelets and white cells uh, mm -hmm. because of, uh, of these symptoms. And uh, it's probably not terribly common, and I don't think it's very well documented, but I've seen patients with pulmonary failure from documented extramural hematopoiesis, which actually at times responds quite well to JAK2 mm -hmm. inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are, I think, uh, each relapse is different for each patient. It's, it's not surprising. Yeah, so it seems to me that we have several ways of how patients either lose the benefit or progress mm -hmm. yeah. or uh, develop some toxicities that uh, uh, perhaps require those adjustments that are not effective anymore. But the common theme that I hear, apart from transformation to acute myeloid leukemia, is that we should be optimizing the therapy by introducing other medications or procedures and really do the best we can to maintain the patients for whatever benefit they have. If they lost the spleen response, maybe the symptoms are still controlled or like you were uh, giving your examples, the other benefits that are possible there, we should be prudent not to discount any benefit because once you stop, you have worsening. Mm -hmm. The patients are really, again, at, uh, at loss, basically, what to do next right. because there are not too many options. Right. You mentioned one uh, option is the reintroduction. Obviously, clinical study would be another option. Transplant would be obviously there for us if we don't really wait for too long for them to uh, be in such a bad shape. But what else can we do? Is there anything else to offer the patients that we really judge, you lost response, what do we do now? Is there anything else? Do we need to do other testing or is there something else that we are missing here that needs to be introduced when we have patients that lost completely every benefit? No, unfortunately, we don't have a solid data. We have anecdotal <coughs> evidence that busulfan may be helpful in some patients whose white count go to 100,000 mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and you start to control it and they feel better. But it's, uh, there are no, uh, no hard data to validate it as a universal approach. And, and uh, I think that as I think you have uh, been the instrumental developing is that uh, the JAK2 inhibitors are the only proven agents so far which uh, in controlled studies have provided a meaningful benefit. And the other uh, options which we all do, and patients get anemic, some patients may respond to androgen, many don't. Some patients respond to erythropoietin, uh, don't. In our state, it's very difficult for her to have an insurance company to pay for uh, uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents mm -hmm. because it's, for, uh, it's not universally approved. So. So, but I agree with, with what you said. I think it's that we in academic environment should create new knowledge and we should test mm -hmm. new agents and there are a lot so, of mm -hmm. promising agents which work at the bench and it remains to be seen whether 
in the clinic would work or not. Um, certainly one of the, the byproducts of now having real phase three data in myelofibrosis as opposed to where we were in the past is we've really seen objectively what is the performance of many of these therapies we utilized in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and we see that really objectively their performance is fairly poor. Right. You know, whether it be other agents for shrinking the spleen largely are, are pretty ineffective. Again, I agree there may be select cases for splenectomy, but it still is a pretty difficult therapy for people to undergo. Uh, splenic radiotherapy, again, very select cases, but can be, have profound myelosuppression. Our agents for anemia are, are quite disappointing overall, although there are exceptions with imids and things of that nature. So I think that's probably one of the strong reasons there's more clinical trials for myelofibrosis at the moment now than really have ever been before. You know, so the ability to, for patients to access trials for myelofibrosis is much broader than it has been. Certainly in the past, to access such a trial, probably one would have had to have come to one of, one of our centers or, or another limited handful of other MPN-focused centers. But now that is not necessarily the case. There is a much broader uh, network of, of centers involved with MPN trials, particularly for myelofibrosis patients. Here's a last question. Now that we discussed uh, and identified heterogeneity among patients, and their experience uh, with the JAK2 inhibitors and all the ways that they can come back with the symptoms, signs, or transformation. Is there a, a, a need, or is it even possible, to come up with some guidelines what the loss of response is? It's difficult because it is a heterogeneous mm -hmm. type of loss mm -hmm. of, of response. It's very different than let's say the, the cousin disease of chronic myeloid leukemia mm -hmm. where we can have a, an objective mm -hmm. marker such as the BCR able levels which end up predicting some hard endpoints such as progression. Did Toyosi, what do you think? I agree. I think the heterogeneity in terms of how these patients present um, really makes it challenging. On the other hand, I acknowledge that there is a need to have a uni at least a semi-uniform set of guidelines to, to help us figure this out. This would probably be most important, I would say, in the clinical trial arena, because as new agents are being tested in, quote unquote, the second line or third line setting in myelofibrosis, uh, it would be nice to get a sense of how uniform or not the entry criteria for such trials are. So Very good I point. think we, we need to work on it. And I would like to just add in terms of, you know, this uh, sometimes what we may define as a loss of response. For example, one of my patients, uh, one of her primary complaints was her fatigue is starting to get really bad. She continues to experience pain on the left side of her ribs. For many times, you know, we said, oh, could this be the bone pains that uh, people have been referring to associated with the disease? So, you know, we've kind of maximized the dose of the drug at that point. Thankfully, her counts have kind of sustained itself, so there was no problem, but the symptoms continued. And then eventually, a couple of months later, she was actually found to have breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I think it raises the question of, Absolutely. again, we need to make sure that we uh, also look for alternative causes whenever, you know, patients do, you know, I think the strength of clinical medicine still doesn't really replace, and we can't always attribute every single symptom just related to the disease. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. Very good, uh, thank you all very much for a lovely discussion. Uh, this is unresolvable at this point in time, <laughs> we all agree I would say, but it's worth pursuing because more and more patients are being treated with JAK inhibitors mm -hmm. and for everyday practice, loss of response is a big issue. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You.